And I'll be talking about, talking about Granger Causality Networks for a Categorical Time Series, and this is joint work with my two advisors, Emily Fox and Ali Shojai. So to introduce this topic, uh, imagine that you're in a forest and that there are many birds, and each bird is chirping, and each bird chirps a different note. You observe different notes at each time point, so we have time point one, time point two, all through here. And we want to understand which birds are influencing other birds based on their song patterns. Does anyone have a guess what, uh, which bird's influencing which other bird? Well, you might guess that the red bird is influencing the blue bird, since the, the sequence has shifted a bit. Um, it seems to be copying that one. So that's kind of a fabricated example, but um, other examples might be genetic regulatory networks where you are observing different genes and these genes can be different, can be on or off or some in-between state. Another one that um, we're currently considering is functional brain connectivity. So each region of the brain can be classified into a different state at a different time point. And then you can understand connectivity at this more abstract level. So I think uh, Rahul talked about getting connectivity where you're actually getting raw recordings, but this is a more abstract level where we're first going to classify the different regions and then look at network structure from there. So goals that we want to be able to do this are we want our model to be both flexible and simple. We want it to be computationally fast for inference, and we want it to be able to scale to many time series such as a large number of birds. So let me first introduce some notation. We're going to have x, j, t. That's going to be the, um, the category that time series j has at time point t. And we're going to, for simplicity, assume that each time series takes on one of m states. And we're going to have p number of time series. So we're going to choose to model the state transition, so the, the probability of transitioning to a new state at time t given the past states at t minus 1 as a multivariate Markov chain. So all this says is that our, uh, our transition probability is only dependent on the state behind us by one lag. And furthermore, we're going to make one more additional assumption that the transition distribution factorizes across, uh, across time series. So what this says is time, at time t, xjt is going to be conditionally independent of xit given the past states of the chain. This will help us uh, make inference much faster, since we can only, since we'll be able to decouple inference across each time series. And finally, we're going to use this notion of Granger causality, which is a notion of how you can understand dependence between different time series. So we're going to say that x uh, x one is not Granger causal for x j if its conditional probability is basically not dependent on that time series. It's a pretty intuitive definition, but it's one that we'll exploit when we uh, develop models and inference for this problem. OK, so if we wanted to model the entire conditional probability table, that would require storing about roughly m to the p plus 1 parameters. So this is a really large tensor. Um, you can think of it that way. So here I have one example where you have x1 t on one axis, x2 t minus 1, and x1 t minus 1. Um, but basically, as the, as the number of time series grows, this quickly becomes infeasible to use this uh, non-parametric representation to uh, model. So instead, we're going to consider model-based um, factorizations that will make this easier. But I do want to stress that there is future work that we're thinking about where we're going to try and maybe have some sort of latent structure on this tensor that we learn on the fly, rather than assuming it, as I'll be talking about now. Right. So we're going to seek a factorization where the number of parameters does not grow too quickly. It's easy to specify Granger non-causality, and we have fast inference. Okay. So to do this, um, I'm, we're going to use what's called the multiple transition distribution model. And this was a model invented by Adrian Raftery in the 80s, actually. And it has been studied pretty consistently since then. And um, there's been a bunch of, uh, of inference algorithms and applications that it's been used for. Uh, but to explain what it is, it's the, we have the conditional probability of 
one time series, given the past states of all the other ones, is a convex combination of pairwise probability tables. So here we have a, these gamma terms are weights that sum to one, and then we have these probability tables, pj, which is the pairwise probability distribution that um, time series i is in state, a certain state given the state of time series xj at time t minus one. Right, so you basically have this convex combination of pairwise probability tables. And we also uh, introduce an offset term or a baseline probability vector, p naught. So this is a quick demonstration of what this looks like intuitively. So we have this whole probability tensor here and we're gonna factorize it as this, as this sum of different uh, probability tables uh, along different axes of the tensor. So how do we specify Granger causality in this model? Well, it turns out that there are two ways that are equivalent. One is that these gamma j terms back here are gonna be zero, right? So if those are zero, then the, that one time series won't affect xi. And another is if all columns of the probability table in pj are constant, right? So if they're all constant, then it doesn't depend on what the state is of xj, it, and so it's, it satisfies our, uh, our definition of Granger on causality, which is conditional independence. So it turns out that one thing that this uh, result tells you is that the MTD factorization for a particular probability distribution is not unique. So there can be many different factorizations that support the same distribution, but I'm gonna get to this problem later and how we are gonna deal with it in practice, but using these results, we can still detect Granger non-causality using one of these two um, uh, criteria. So the MTD model has been, inference in this model has been studied quite a bit and um, it turns out that there aren't actually any good or satisfying optimization procedures out there right now. And many of these model fitting procedures are based on maximum likelihood inference. So the, you can rewrite the negative log likelihood in this form. Um, so where we just have the log at each time point of the probability um, of that observation or that state given the past states. And here I just use the notation pj as the probability table with this index xit xj t minus one to, um, dis to distinguish which element in that table is gonna be used, right? So I just have this little picture here showing you with a probability table and that one of them is selected. And it has these constraints right here, which is you need these PJs to be probability tables. So each column has to sum to one. Furthermore, each entry has to be greater than zero. And furthermore, we have the same constraints on the gammas. They have to be uh, all greater than zero and sum to one. So the first thing you might see from this is that it's not convex. All right, we have these two different uh, parameters here, these gammas and these Ps, they're multiplied together. Right, so there's, the problem's not convex with many local optima. There's also many linear equality and inequality constraints, and it turns out that most of the current optimization procedures are based on nonlinear optimization, so they're gonna have many uh, multiple restarts and things like that to deal with the local optima problem. But it turns out that there's an extremely simple um, reformulation of the problem where you just say zj equals gamma j pj, and then you can rewrite all of the constraints in terms of your zj's, and it, it actually becomes a convex problem. So there's this simple trick that lets you uh, recast it as a convex problem. So it turns out that this uh, substitution actually helps us do a lot of different things at once. For, so first off, by the, since it's now convex, it, we have guarantees to find a globally optimal solution. We can now use convex penalties for model selection since the problem is convex. We'll also have um, identifiability uh, constraints that this substitution um, really helps the proofs for what these identifiability constraints will be. And we'll also be able to use efficient algorithms for optimization and convex optimization that were not available previously. Okay, so first I'll talk about model selection. So how we're gonna do this is 
uh, we want to select for Granger causality here, so we're going to try and try and penalize the gammas to be zero. So right, if a gamma is zero, that means that there's going to be Granger non-causality between gamma between xj and xi. Uh, so that's what we want to solve, but we can have two convex relaxations to this problem, where now we're going to penalize basically the size of this z matrix. And recall that z is equal to gamma times, times this p, this probability table. So if the whole z thing shrinks down to zero, then basically gamma is going to be zero as well. So we'll have Granger non-causality. So just a quick pictorial thing. This group lasso is basically shrinking all the elements in this zj table to zero so that we can detect uh, Granger non-causality. And you can show formally that both, both of these are uh, convex relaxations to the, the top problem. But you kind of both go along different, each go, go along different avenues, actually, of showing it. OK. So we also get identifiability results from this parameterization. So it turns out that every MTD distribution has a unique parameterization such that the minimal element in each row of zj or pj is zero for all of j. So it turns out that any, every MTD distribution can, has a factorization of this form. Whereas, basically, this is useful because the MTD factorization is not unique. So usually when you do identifiability or estimation, you want to restrict your estimation to a particular subset of the model space, both for um, just to make inference better, because it's going to be more stable if there's only one global solution, and for uh, interpretation. So it turns out that if you, if you have a penalized problem that you're solving, like this at the bottom, where LMTDZ is the likelihood that I uh, mentioned on the previous slide, then we have this theorem here, which says that for any lambda greater than 0 in penalty term, that does not depend on z0, so it doesn't penalize the offset. And it's also increasing with respect to the absolute values of the entries in zj in each probability table. Then it turns out that the solution to this problem is contained in this set of identifiable models at the top. So what this means is that we can actually constrain our estimation and solution that we're getting to our identifiable space if we just add a penalty term. And it, the two penalties that I mentioned previously, this group lasso and lasso both fall into that case of uh, that satisfy the conditions required for this theorem. So the takeaway here is that we have a convex formulation of our problem. We ha the, uh, the substitution allows us to introduce these identifiability conditions. And furthermore, the penalized problem that we want to solve to detect Granger causality automatically gives our optimal solution in this identifiable set. So the last kind of component of all of this is optimization. So I think this problem, type of problem, actually has some interesting new um, elements in optimization and issues. And that is basically that you have these non-smooth penalties, but you also have a lot of linear equality and inequality constraints. Um, it turns out for what we're looking at, though, that um, since we have this constraint that zj is between 0 and 1, the penalty constraints are actually smooth over our constraint sets. So, but they're then non-differentiable only at the boundary. Um, so we're going to use a projected gradient method with line search. Gradient projection is solved by a quadratic program. And in practice, an acceleration scheme uh, helps a lot. So right before I talk about some simulated data results, I'm just going to introduce an alternate model that you might suspect or might suggest. And that is the, uh, a multi-output logistic autoregression model. So it's just a standard categorical GLM. It's been used a lot in modeling IID graphical models of categorical data. So you just do this uh, uh, kind of, um, sorry, right. And it's also been used in the binary category setting for that's, for that's n equals two categories. But uh, for us, this is a novel application to networks of general categorical time series with an arbitrary number of categories. And it also allows us to compare the GLM versus MTD models. Both were actually sort of developed around the same time. So it's interesting that now we can compare them. Um, so here I've just given an example in my old notation of what the transition distribution is for this GLM model. So to compare them through simulations, we've 
compared both of them um, to estimate some network, and then we compare their ROC curves in estimating this network. So we have three settings. One is where we generate our data um, from a sparse MTD model that I've talked about. Another is that we generate our data from a sparse GLM model, or this uh, the categorical GLM that I talked about on the previous slide. And the next is that we generate data from a latent VAR model, but then we quantize basically each time series. So we put it into three categories, like low, medium, and high. And then we want to see if we can estimate network structure from that. And what we have here, and then we compare uh, the GLM model, the MTD model, and both MTD versions where we have the group penalty and the L1 penalty. So from, from this, you can easily see that the, when the true data is generated from the categorical GLM, which I call MLTD, the MLTD optimization procedure does best. Um, and furthermore, for MTD, the MTD method does best at recovery on average. Um, and when we have latent VAR meth, um, data, it actually turns out that our MTD group does significantly better than the other uh, methods. But this is uh, ongoing work, so these are some just preliminary uh, simulation results that I have. So in summary, we've defined Granger causality for categorical time series. We've utilized the MTD model. We've recast it as a convex problem, and we've added different penalties to like for, so like for Granger non-causality. And future work that stuff I'm currently working on is some high dimensional estimation rates for the MTD model. And, uh, also more scalable algorithms. Because currently, um, the computational bottleneck here is in our projected gradient method, where we have to con project onto our constraint set. And our constraints, the number of our constraints are going to grow as the number of time series grows. So, yep, that's all. Thank you very much.